we do have is the Mindy. I knew it. I knew it was coming. So is this the Mindy Division? Mindy Conference. The Mindy Conference. Let me write that down. The Mark Conference, the Mindy Conference. And then within the Mindy Conference, we have the Shazbot Division and the Mirth Division. I like how you say Shazbot. Guys, we got a heavy hitter starting out the Shazbot Division. Mm -hmm. This is the number one seed, 1993's Mrs. Doubtfire. Adam, let me ask you a question. All right. How far would an ordinary father go to spend more time with his children? Eh, are the kids fun? Daniel Hillard <laughs> is no ordinary father. Okay. So when he learns his ex-wife needs a housekeeper, he applies for the job with a perfect wig, a little makeup, and a dress for all occasions. And another Nathan Lane character being annoyingly gay. Yes. And becoming uh, Mrs. <laughs> Doubtfire. Annoyingly gay. A devoted British nanny who is hired on the spot. Free to be the woman he never knew he could be. The disguised Daniel creates a whole new life with his family. And that, like I said, this is by, so uh, it will get to take on one of these two films. Uh, the number nine seed, Jack. 1996. Let me write down Doubtfire here. Jack, because of an unusual aging disorder. Boy, this plot has, hasn't been done a million <laughs> times. Uh, that it, thank you. That has aged him four times faster than a normal human being. A boy enters the fifth grade for the first time with the appearance of a 40-year-old man. By the way, for the record, guys, this movie directed by Francis Ford Coppola. <laughs> what? It is. <laughs> I know. Taking on the number eight seed. He only had like four good films in him. Yeah, I know. Taking on the number eight seed, What Dreams May Come. Dr. Chris Nielsen meets his true soulmate, Annie, marries her, and has two children. The children die in a car accident, and Chris dies four years after that. Ending up in heaven, he is guided by a friendly guardian angel, Albert, through his afterlife, and he is reunited with his dog and children. But when he finds out his wife had committed suicide, he desperately searches for her spirit, journeying through heaven and hell along the way. Jared, this is a tough matchup, or is it? It's not a tough matchup. Okay. Uh, the clear winner here is What Dreams May Come. Uh, Cuba Gooding Jr., very good performance mm -hmm. in it as well. Some stunning visual effects uh, in the portrayals of heaven. Um, I think cutting an edge for the time. An impressionistic Yes, very, world. very good. So, uh, never saw Jack. Sounds terrible. Don't want to see it. What Dreams May Come is your winner. Adam, uh, what dreams may come is one of the only ones in this whole thing where I was like, what? I, I couldn't, it didn't come to me at all. And then I looked at it and I was like, I really, I remember liking that movie. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I really did, but I remember yeah. just like Jared all said, you can the, do. the visuals. Uh, Jack is uh, up there with uh, Clifford, the Martin Short movie, <laughs> oh, where boy. he, for some reason, plays a 10-year-old, but it's never explained why there's an adult male playing a 10 It's like the same basic movie, yep. and they're both fucking terrible. So uh, I'm going to go with... Uh, what you're saying? Yeah, I'll, I'll concur with both of you. This movie was a visual feast, had some plot issues here and there, uh, a little bit too saccharine, idealistic from time to time. Uh, Cuba Gooding Jr., Jared, coming off of his uh, Oscar-winning turn as uh, the football player in the Tom Cruise film. Mm -hmm. Jerry Maguire. Jerry Maguire. Thank you. Uh, so this, I think I think this might have been his follow-up <laughs> role to that. Yeah, I think so. Uh, so Two in a row. At least he got two in a row. Yep, notable. It's a it notable. All, all came um, boy, I mean, it's hard to put two back-to-back -back films together. Good ones. Good ones. Uh, okay, you know. I thought you were being sarcastic. No, no. So there we go. What so, Dreams May Come advances, taking on Mrs. Doubtfire in the next round. But before we get to that, we've got a lot more films to cover. Interesting uh, round here. We've got the number five seed, 1997's Flubber. Professor uh, Philip Brainyard, an absent-minded professor, works with his assistant, Weebo, trying to create a substance that's a new source of energy and that will save... Medfield College, where his sweetheart Sarah is the president. Boy, what a pitch that would be in the, <laughs> in the studio. He has missed the wedding twice, and on the afternoon of his third wedding, professor, the professor creates Flubber, which allows objects to fly through the air. It also looks like green rubber, so he calls it Flubber. The film is based on the 1961... Why not Grubber? Dis I know, it's a good question. Oh, flying, that's the F film. Okay. The, dis the film is based on the 1961 Disney classic, The Absent-Minded Professor. This is taking on the 1992 film, 12 Seated Toys. Leslie Zevo is a son of an eccentric toy maker when Leslie was closest to his father and while Leslie was closest to his father and works as a toy maker himself, his military general uncle, Leland, inherits the toy making factory and begins to make war toys. Leslie, however, does not see eye to eye with his uncle as his father had a policy against making war toys. When the general begins making living weaponry behind Leslie's back and recruiting children to pilot the army, Leslie, his friends, and his family band together to put an end to the general's tyranny. I will start this off first. Uh, Flubber is one of my uh, least favorite movies ever. Uh, but So let's move to toys for a second. <laughs> this movie is was kind of critically maligned 
But I like this movie when I saw it. And I'll tell you why. It was a bit of a, a visual. It was sort of in that what dreams may come type of film where it was it dared to do things different visually. Um, the plot really was sort of a Willy Wonka-ish type of thing where you've got this weird Willy Wonka character. It yeah. was way too on the nose about what it was trying to get by. Way too idealistic. Uh, but I kind of appreciated some of the weird casting they did with LL Cool J and Joan Cusack was in there as his weird sister. Um, and uh, soundtrack done by, or at least par par partially done by Wendy and Lisa of Prince's... Uh, revolution you know phase. way more about this movie than i expected you to <laughs> so i'm picking toys jared to you um i also did not like flubber and i only barely remember toys but i remember liking parts of it and not liking other parts of it yeah so uh begrudgingly i'll have to give the nod to toys you are both wrong mm. and i would advise you go back and watch toys toys pretended to be a children's movie and was marketed as sure. a children's movie. video game super nintendo game it is not <laughs> yeah it is not a children's movie it lied to people. It is fucking terrible. Oh. Wow. Wow. It but, is terrible. So it's not a children's movie. It's an adult movie. Is that what you're saying? Or it's a terrible movie? It's both. Okay. So maybe you could have said it was marketed as a good movie, but it's actually a <laughs> terrible movie. You're losing me on your... Interesting. We have a uh, voicemail later in the program of talking about mismarketing of films. Uh, so I, despite Flubber being just dumb, it at least was marketed as to who the people should be watching it. Children. Okay. So I would pick that. Okay, fair enough. Uh, you miss out, but uh, that's okay. We have got, we'll have we have a great matchup coming up uh, against Toys. Uh, this movie has a buy. It's the number four seed. It's 1998's Patch Adams. <laughs> What's that? I don't know. Uh, everyone knows that this. I pick this as one of my least favorite movies of all time. We've talked about it on the show. We've talked about how um, I sat next to the St. Paul movie critic after watching this film and told him, you better give this a bad rating because it was terrible. Uh, the story is based on a partially based on a true story. Uh, a 1969, Hunter Adams was a troubled man who voluntarily committed himself to into a mental institution. Once there, he finds that helping his fellow inmates there gives him a purpose in life. Thus inspired, he leaves the asylum and vows to become a doctor to help people professionally. However, he finds what he finds is that at medical schools is a sickening, sickeningly callous philosophy that advocates an arm's length attitude to the patients and does not address their emotional needs or the quality of their lives. Patch is determined to find a better way to help them, although the consequences of his defiance of the rules and the authority are severe. Uh, this is Robin Williams doing his typical comedic shtick. Uh, does not work for me in any form, shape. I think it's a terrible movie, one of the worst ever made. Are and you I, saying that I love buy, Robin Williams? Buy should win this one. I'm saying buy should win this movie. <laughs> it's um, going to be an interesting matchup in the next bracket then. Jared it advances. Jared, yeah, I'll send it over to you next, and we'll let Adam. Uh, well, but do we want to save our, our critique of this film until the bracket? Yeah, okay. until we it's competition. Okay, well, yeah. I mean, I, my critique is well known. So obviously, <laughs> Patch Adams goes on to the next round. Now we move into the mirth division. This is our final division. We've got some great matchups here. Um, this, this movie is moving on to the next round immediately because it's bide. It's 1997's Good Will Hunting. Gender at MIT, Will Hunting is a gift for math and chemistry that can take him light years beyond his blue-collar roots. Light years. But he doesn't realize his potential and can't even imagine leaving his childhood Boston South End neighborhood, his construction job, or his best friend. To complicate matters, several strangers enter the equation. A brilliant math professor who discovers and even envies Will's gifts, an empathic shrink who identifies with Will's blue-collar roots, and a beautiful, gifted pre-med student who shows him, for the first time in his life, the possibility of love. God. Sounds a little cheesy when you hear it that way, doesn't uh, it, Adam? Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter what everybody thinks here. Goodwill goes on to the next round. We'll talk about that film in detail mm -hmm. when we get there. But here's a true matchup, guys. Number 11 seed, 1984 movie, Moscow on the Hudson, another movie played on HBO quite a bit back in the day. A Russian circus visits the, visits the U.S. A clown wants a defect but doesn't have the nerve. However, his saxophone-playing friend comes to the decision to defect in the middle of Bloomingdale's. He's befriended by the black security guard and falls in love with the Italian immigrant from behind the perfume counter. We follow his life as he works his way through the American dream and tries to find work as a musician. Movie came out right in the heart of Reaganomics. Uh, patriotism, yo. This takes on the number six film, possibly the best year of Robin Williams' acting career, 19 or 2002, mm -hmm. Insomnia. This is a complicated one, so... Buckle up, folks. Cappuccino. Christopher Nolan's film, sent from the city to investigate the murder of a teenage girl in small-town Alaska, 
a police detective played by Al Pacino, accidentally shoots his own partner while trying to apprehend a suspect. Instead of admitting his guilt, however, the detective is given an unexpected alibi, but this solution only multiplies the emotional complexity and guilt over his partner's death. He's also got a murder to solve, in addition to the blackmail and framing of an innocent bystander being orchestrated by the man they were originally chasing. Wrap your head around this. There's also a local detective, played by Hilary Swank, coming, uh, she's, this is one of her big roles here, who is conducting her own personal investigation of, her, of his partner's death. Will it all come crashing down on him? So, Moscow on the Hudson versus Insomnia. Adam. Well, this is easy. Uh, Moscow on the Hudson is the only movie on this whole thing I have never seen or recall seeing. So, I have to give it to Insomnia, which I thought was okay yeah. when I saw it. Uh, not as good as the other movie that Robin Williams did in 2002, in my opinion. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. Um, uh, this is Hilary Swank coming off of her big fi- oscar winning turn. Boys Don't Cry. In Boys Don't Cry. So Robin Williams has a habit of hooking up with people after they've done Oscar-worthy performances. Very interesting. Um, this is a Christopher Nolan film that Robin Williams uh, got a lot of, or Christopher Nolan got a lot of crap for picking Robin Williams as the main uh, antagonist of the film. I thought Robin Williams did a great job in mm-hmm. it, um, but... It didn't resonate with me as much as uh, his other film of that year. As I said before, I'm still picking Insomnia over Moscow on the Hudson, which has Robin Williams doing an interesting Yakov Smirnoff imitation. Jared. <laughs> uh, like Adam, I don't recall having ever seen Moscow on the Hudson. I, I rather liked Insomnia. I think this was this his follow up to Memento. Yeah. I believe it was. It ble- yes. A lot yeah. of Robin Williams picking good act, good people to work with at yeah. the proper times. Isn't yeah. He? So, and I, I enjoyed uh, the film quite a bit. So I, uh, I know it doesn't matter, but I'm picking Insomnia. It advances. All right. Well, our last, uh, our last matchup in the Mirth division takes on two films or puts two films together. The number seven seed Bicentennial Man, 1999. Jared and I saw this in the theater. This follows the life and times of lead of the lead character, an android who was purchased as a household program, pro, household robot programmed to perform menial tasks. Within a few days, the Martin family realizes they don't have an ordinary droid as Andrew begins to experience emotions and creative thought. In a story that spans two centuries, Jared, Andrew learns the intricacies of human, humanity while trying to stop those who created him from destroying him. This takes on uh, Robin Williams' other film from 2002, One Hour Photo. It's the 10th seed. A department store photo clerk, size Parrish, is exceptionally knowledgeable about photography and has been developing photos for the Yorkin family since their son was a baby. However, Sai also lives a very solitary and lonely life with no wife, girlfriend, or family in the picture. Sai begins to develop a disturbing obsession with the Yorkins and what they have, and when he is fired for theft, he goes over the top. Having discovered a disturbing secret about Mr. Yorkin, he exacts angry revenge, revenge in a chilling manner. Um, I'll start this one off. One Hour Photo is one of my all-time favorite Robin Williams films. I think that uh, it is perfectly done. It It's interesting because you couldn't do that film nowadays. This was probably about the last year where you could have a story about a photo booth, essentially. Um, he plays this bleach blonde weirdo that lives a life that is in perfect pain and, and sadness and isolation. And for some reason, it makes me... It sort of I sort of feel like... Robin is channeling some of what he had inside of him. I think that's what this role tells me. I thought it was perfectly done, sublime, and uh, the I think the outcome was very interesting of this film. Uh, easy one-hour photo goes on to the next round for me. Adam? Uh, I didn't like that movie. I did not like one-hour photo. Um, I felt like Robin Williams being cast in this role was a bit of stunt casting uh, to make an otherwise mundane movie more interesting, but nothing about it rang... Uh, as true or interesting or anything to me. Uh, I don't really like Bicentennial Man either, but I kind of remember finding it neat uh, when I saw it. <laughs> uh, uh, it's like faint praise, the, the faintest of praise. But so I, I'm I'm going to pick Bicentennial Man. All right, we'll throw it over to Jared for the tiebreaker. I think this is our first contested uh, battle. Yeah, I love it. I love it that way. Uh you reminded me that we saw Bicentennial Man mm-hmm. in the theater. That's how much I regard this film. Yep. I didn't remember Great seeing it. Great special effects. Yeah. Robin Williams looks like a weird robot. I just didn't, it didn't stick with me, obviously. And I don't, I don't recall having a positive response to it. So, but uh, I don't think I like one hour photo as much as you do, but I do enjoy it. And I don't think that Robin Williams was miscast at all. I think it was a nice turn, a nice sinister, dark turn for someone who t- often played uh, serious uh, or comedic roles, yep. but not, nothing really dark or, or evil or anything. I'm not, evil is not the right term, but you know, 
Not good. <laughs> Whatever. One hour photo advances. So there we go. One hour photo advances. The last round. Um, this movie gets a buy. It's the second seed. It's 1991. Hook. Robin Williams works with Steven Spielberg. Peter Pan, Peter Pan has grown up to be a cutthroat merger and acquisitions lawyer and is married to Wendy's granddaughter. Captain Hook, played by Dustin Hoffman, kidnaps his children, and Peter returns to Never Never Land with Tinkerbell, played by Julia Roberts. With the help oh, of right. with the help of her and the Lost Boys, he must remember how to be Peter Pan again in order to save his children by battling with Captain Hook another time. So this movie gets, gets the buy. It moves on to take on One Hour Photo in the Mirth Division. Guess what, guys? The first 32 battles, or the first 16 <laughs> battles, are taken care of. Be a long We're going. We're going. Ladies and gentlemen, we find ourselves once again at the end. I hope you've enjoyed our time together. I know I have. Fear not, Scope Faithful. Days shall pass as if they were but a moment. And Jared, Adam, and Shane will return with another thrilling episode. Until then, send your comments to comments at thescopeshow.com or leave a voicemail message by dialing 612-21-SCOPE. That's 612-217-2673. Thanks for listening, faithful fans. This is Tony Partington saying adios. Tune in next time to another terrific edition of The Scope. Scope.